Good evening and welcome again to Free to, Free to Choose from the Barber Surgeons Hall here in the City of London. This is the last of six programmes exploring, assessing, debating, criticising the economic theories and in some cases political views of the noted American economist and Nobel Prize winner Professor Milton Friedman. Here in front of an invited audience of bankers, economists and others interested in Professor Friedman's views, I have two men who may be presumed to have a particular interest in tonight's topic, how to cure inflation. They are, of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Geoffrey Howe, and his predecessor and shadow, the former Chancellor, Mr. Dennis Healy. They'll have an opportunity to hear from Professor Friedman how he thinks they did and are doing, and to tell him how useful or otherwise they found his theories in their attempts, past and present, to cure inflation in Britain. But first, as usual, we start with a personal statement on film by Professor Friedman of his basic argument. He asked the question, how to cure inflation? The Sierra Nevadas in California, 10,000 feet above sea level. In the winter, temperatures drop to 40 below zero. In the summer, the place bakes in the thin mountain air. In this unlikely spot, the town of Bodie sprang up. In its day, Bodie was filled with prostitutes, drunkards, and gamblers. Part of the colorful history of the American West. A century ago, this was a town of 10,000 people. What brought them here? Gold. If this were real gold, people would be scrambling for it. A series of gold strikes throughout the West brought people from all over the world, all kinds of people. They came here for one purpose and one purpose only, to strike it rich, quick. But in the process, they built towns, cities, in places where nobody would otherwise have dreamed of building a city. Gold built these cities, and when the gold was exhausted, the cities collapsed and became ghost towns. Many of the people who came here ended up the way they began, broken, unhappy, but a few struck it rich. For them, gold was real wealth, but was it for the world as a whole? People couldn't eat the gold, they couldn't wear the gold, they couldn't live in houses made of gold. Because there was more gold, they had to pay a little more gold to buy goods and services. The prices of things in terms of gold went up. At tremendous cost, at sacrifice of lives, people dug gold out of the bowels of the earth. What happened to that gold? Eventually, at long last, it was transported to distant places, only to be buried again under the ground. This time, in the vaults of banks throughout the world. There's hardly anything that hasn't been used for money. Rock salt in Ethiopia, brass rings in West Africa, cowrie shells in Uganda, even a toy cannon. Anything can be used as money. Crocodile money in Malaysia. Absurd, isn't it? That beleaguered minority of the population that still smokes may recognize this stuff as the raw material from which their cigarettes are made. But in the early days of the colonies, long before the United States was established, this was money. It was a common money of Virginia, Maryland, and the Carolinas. It was used for all sorts of things. The legislature voted that it could be used legally to pay taxes. It was used to buy food, clothing, and housing. Indeed, one of the most interesting sights was to see the husky young fellows at that time lug a hundred pounds of it down to the docks to pay the costs of the passage of the beauteous young ladies who had come over from England to be their brides. Now, you know how money is. There's a tendency for it to grow, for more and more of it to be produced, and that's what happened with this tobacco. As more tobacco was produced, there was more money, and as always when there's more money, prices went up, inflation. Indeed, at the very end of the process, prices were 40 times as high in terms of tobacco as they had been at the beginning of the process. And as always, when inflation occurs, people complained. And as always, the legislature tried to do something. And as always, to very little avail. 
They prohibited certain classes of people from growing tobacco. They tried to reduce the total amount of tobacco grown. They required people to destroy part of their tobacco, but it did no good. Finally, many people took it into their own hands and they went around destroying other people's tobacco fields. That was too much. And they passed a law making it a capital offense, punishable by death, to destroy somebody else's tobacco. Gresham's Law, one of the oldest laws in economics, was well illustrated. That law says that cheap money drives out dear money, and so it was with tobacco. Anybody who had a debt to pay, of course, tried to pay it in the worst quality of tobacco he had. He saved the good tobacco to sell overseas for hard money. The result was that bad money drove out good money. Finally, almost a century after they had started using tobacco as money, they established warehouses in which tobacco was deposited in barrels certified by an inspector according to his views as to its quality and quantity. And they issued warehouse certificates, which people gave from one to another to pay for the bills that they accumulated. These pieces of green printed paper are today's counterparts of those tobacco certificates, except that they bear no relation to any commodity. In this program, I want to take you to Britain to see how inflation weakens the social fabric of society. Then, to Tokyo, where the Japanese had the courage to cure inflation. To Berlin, where there's a lesson to be learned from the West Germans in how so-called cures are often worse than the disease. And to Washington, where our government keeps these machines working overtime. And I'm going to show you how inflation can be cured. The fact is that most people enjoy the early stages of the inflationary process. Britain, in the swinging 60s, there was plenty of money around. Business was brisk, jobs were plentiful, and prices had not yet taken off. Everybody seemed happy at first. But by the early 70s, as the good times rolled along, prices started to rise more and more rapidly. Soon, some of these people were going to lose their jobs. We have got it the party was coming to an end. The story is much the same in the United States, only the process started a little later. We've had one inflationary party after another, yet we still can't seem to avoid them. How come? Before every election, our representatives would like to make us think we're getting a tax break. And they're able to do it, while at the same time actually raising our taxes because of a bit of magic they have in their kit bag. That magic is inflation. They reduce the tax rates, but the taxes we have to pay go up because we are automatically shoved into higher brackets by the effect of inflation. A neat trick, taxation without representation. The more I work, it seems like the more they take off of me. I know if I work an extra day or two extra days, what they take in federal income tax alone is, is almost doubled because it apparently puts you in a higher income tax bracket and it takes more off you. Bob Crawford lives with his wife and three children in a suburb of Pittsburgh. They're a fairly average American family. Don't slam the door, Daphne. Okay. All right. What are you doing? Making your favorite dish. Okay. We went to the Crawfords' home after he'd spent a couple of days working out his federal and state income taxes for the year. For our benefit, he tried to estimate all the other taxes he had paid as well. In the end, though, he didn't discover much that will surprise anybody. Inflation is going up. Everything's getting more expensive. No matter what you do, you, as soon as you walk out of the house, everything going up. Your gas bills keep going up. Electric bills, uh, your gasoline. Uh, you can name a thousand things that are going up. But just everything's going sky high. Your food. My wife goes to the, to the grocery store. We used to live on, say, $60 or $50 every two weeks just for our basic food. Now it's $80 or $90 every two weeks. Things are just, they're going out of sight as far as expense 
to live on. Like I say, it's getting tough, and, and, and the, it seems like every month it gets worse and worse. And I don't know where it's going to end. At the end of the day, I've spent nearly $6,000 of my earnings on taxes. That leaves me with a total of $12,000 to live on. That might seem like a lot of money, but five, six years ago, I was earning $12,000. How does taxation without representation really affect how much the Crawford family has left to spend after it's paid its income taxes? Well, in 1972, Bob Crawford earned $12,000. Some of that income was not subject to income tax. After paying income tax on the rest, he had this much left to spend. Six years later, he was earning $18,000 a year. By 1978, the amount free from tax was larger but he was now in a higher tax bracket. So his taxes went up by a larger percentage than his income. However, those dollars weren't worth anything like as much. Even his wages, let alone his income after taxes, hadn't kept up with inflation. His buying power was lower than before. That is taxation without representation in practice. We had a number of you brothers that are sitting here today that were with us on that committee. And uh, I'd like to tell you one of the things... There are many traditional scapegoats blamed for inflation. How often have you heard inflation blamed on labor unions for pushing up wages? Workers, of course, don't agree. But, fellas, this is not true. This is a subterfuge. This is a myth. Your wage rates are not creating inflation. And he's right. Higher wages are mostly a result of inflation rather than a cause of it. Economists in this country. That Indeed, that the impression that unions cause inflation like arises partly because union wages are slow to react to inflation. inflation. And then there's pressure to catch up. On a day to day basis, trying to represent our own members. But that, in fact, is not the case. Uh, not only can we not play catch up, we can't even maintain a wage rate commensurate with the cost of living that's going up in this country. Another scapegoat for inflation is the cost of goods coming from abroad. Inflation, we're told, is important. Higher prices abroad driving up prices at home. It's another way government can blame someone else for inflation. But this argument, too, is wrong. The prices of imports in the countries from which they come are not in terms of dollars. They're in terms of lira or yen or other foreign currencies. What happens to their prices in dollars depends on exchange rates, which in turn reflect inflation in the United States. Since 1973, some governments have had a field day blaming the Arabs for inflation. But if high oil prices were the cause of inflation, how is it that inflation has been less here in Germany, a country that must import every drop of oil and gas that it uses on the roads in an industry, than, for example, it is in the United States? which produces half of its own oil. Japan has no oil of its own at all. Yet at the very time that the Arabs were quadrupling oil prices, the Japanese people were bringing inflation down from 30 to less than 5% a year. The fallacy is to confuse particular prices, like the price of oil, with prices in general. Back at home, President Nixon understood this. Now here's what I will not do. I will not take this nation down the road of wage and price controls, however politically expedient that may seem. Controls and rationing may seem like an easy way out, but they are really an easy way in to more trouble. To the explosion that follows when you try to clamp a lid on a rising head of steam without turning down the fire under the pot. Wage and price controls only postpone a day of reckoning, and in so doing, they rob every American of a very important part of his freedom. Now listen to this. The time has come for decisive action, action that will break the vicious circle of spiraling prices and costs. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. In addition, I call upon corporations to extend 
the wage price freeze to all dividends. Many a political leader has been tempted to turn to wage and price controls, despite their repeated failure in practice. On this subject, they never seem to learn. But some lessons may be learned. That happened to British Prime Minister James Callaghan, who finally discovered that a very different economic myth was wrong. He told the Labour Party conference about it in 1976. We used to think that you could use spend your way out of a recession and increase employment by cutting taxes and boosting government spending. I tell you in all candor that that option no longer exists. It only worked on each occasion since the war by injecting a bigger dose of inflation into the economy, followed by a higher level of unemployment as the next step. That's the history of the last 20 years. Well, it's one thing to say it. One reason why inflation does so much harm is because it affects different groups differently. Some benefit, and of course they attribute that to their own cleverness. Some are hurt, and of course they attribute that to the evil actions of other people. And the whole problem is made far worse by the false cures which government adopts, particularly wage and price controls. The garbage collectors in London felt justifiably aggrieved because their wages had not been permitted to keep pace with the cost of living. They struck, hurting not the people who imposed the controls, but their friends and neighbors who had to live with mounting piles of rat-infested garbage. Hospital attendants felt justifiably aggrieved because their wages had not been permitted to keep up with the cost of living. They struck, hurting not the people who imposed the controls, but cancer patients who were turned out of hospital beds. The attendants behaved as a group in a way they never would have behaved as individuals. One group is set against another group. The social fabric of society is torn apart, inflicting scars that it will take decades to heal, and all to no avail, because wage and price controls, far from being a cure for inflation, only make inflation worse. Within the memory of most of our political leaders, there's one vivid example of how economic ruin can be magnified by controls, and a classic demonstration of what to do when it happens. Germany, 1945, a devastated country, a nation defeated in war. The new governing body was the Allied Control Commission, representing the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. They imposed strict controls on practically every aspect of life, including wages and prices. Along with the effects of war, the results were tragic. The basic economic order of the country began to collapse. Money lost its value. People reverted to primitive barter. Or they used cameras, fountain pens, cigarettes, whiskey as money. That was less than 40 years ago. This is Germany as we know it today, transformed into a place a lot of people would like to live in. How did they achieve their miraculous recovery? What did they know that we don't know? Early one Sunday morning, it was June 20th, 1948, the German Minister of Economics, Ludwig Erhard, a professional economist, simultaneously introduced a new currency, today's Deutschmark, and at one fell swoop, abolished almost all controls on prices and wages. Why did he do it on a Sunday morning? It wasn't, as you might suppose, because the stock markets were closed on that day. It was, as he loved to confess, because the offices of the American, the British, and the French occupation authorities were closed that day. He was sure that if he had done it when they were open, they would have countermanded the order. It worked like a charm. Within days, the shops were full of goods. Within months, the German economy was humming along at full steam. Economists weren't surprised at the results. After all, that's what a price system is for. But to the rest of the world, it seemed an economic miracle that a defeated and devastated country could, in little more than a decade, become the strongest economy on the continent of Europe. 
In a sense, this city, West Berlin, is something of a unique economic test tube, set as it is deep in communist East Germany. Two fundamentally different economic systems collide here in Europe, ours and theirs, separated by political philosophies, definitions of freedom, and a steel and concrete wall. To digress from inflation, economic freedom does not stand alone. It's part of a wider order. I wanted to show you how much difference it makes by letting you see how the people live on the other side of that Berlin Wall. But the East German authorities wouldn't let us. The people over there speak the same language as the people over here. They have the same culture. They have the same forebears. They are the same people. Yet you don't need me to tell you how differently they live. There is one simple explanation. The political system over there cannot tolerate economic freedom. The political system over here could not exist without it. But political freedom cannot be preserved unless inflation is kept in bounds. That's the responsibility of government, which has a monopoly over places like this. The reason we have inflation in the United States, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, is because these pieces of paper and the accompanying book entries, or their counterparts in other nations, are growing more rapidly than the quantity of goods and services produced. The truth is, inflation is made in one place and one place only, here in Washington. This is the only place where there are presses like this that turn out these pieces of paper we call money. This is a place where the power resides to determine how rapidly the amount of money shall increase. What happened to all that noise? That's what would happen to inflation if we stopped letting the amount of money grow so rapidly. This is not a new idea. It's not a new cure. It's not a new problem. It's happened over and over again in history. Sometimes inflation has been cured this way on purpose. Sometimes it's happened by accident. During the Civil War, the North, late in the Civil War, overran the place in the South where the printing presses were setting up, where the pieces of paper were being turned out. Prior to that point, the South had had a very rapid inflation. If my memory serves me right, something like 4% a month. It took the Confederacy something over two weeks to find a new place where they could set up their printing presses and start them going again. During that two-week period, inflation came to a halt. After the two-week period, when the presses started running again, inflation started up again. It's that clear, that straightforward. More recently, there's another dramatic example of the only effective way to deal with rampant inflation. In 1973, Japanese housewives going to market were faced with an unpleasant fact. The cash in their purses seemed to be losing its value. Prices were starting to soar as the awful story of inflation began to unfold once again. The Japanese government knew what to do. What's more, they were prepared to do it. When it was all over, economists were able to record precisely what had happened. In 1971, the quantity of money started to grow more rapidly. As always happens, inflation wasn't affected for a time. But by late 1972, it started to respond. In early 73, the government reacted. It started to cut monetary growth. But inflation continued to soar for a time. 
The delayed reaction made 1973 a very tough year of recession. Inflation tumbled only when the government demonstrated its determination to keep monetary growth in check. It took five years to squeeze inflation out of the system. Japan had attained relative stability. Unfortunately, there's no way to avoid the difficult road the Japanese had to follow before they could have both low inflation and a healthy economy. First, they had to live through a recession until slow monetary growth had its delayed effect on inflation. Inflation is just like alcoholism in both cases, when you start drinking or when you start printing too much money. The good effects come first. The bad effects only come later. That's why, in both cases, there's a strong temptation to overdo it, to drink too much and to print too much money. When it comes to the cure, it's the other way around. When you stop drinking or when you stop printing money, the bad effects come first and the good effects only come later. That's why it's so hard to persist with the cure. In the United States, four times in the 20 years after 1957, we undertook the cure. But each time, we lacked the will to continue. As a result, we had all the bad effects and none of the good effects. Japan, on the other hand, by sticking to a policy of slowing down the printing presses for five years, was, by 1978, able to reap all the benefits. Low inflation, and a recovering economy. But there's nothing special about Japan. Every country that has had the courage to persist in a policy of slow monetary growth has been able to cure inflation and at the same time achieve a healthy economy. So there you are. You see, it's all really quite simple. All you've got to do is stop the monetary printing presses and sit on the money supply, and not only will inflation subside, but you'll have a healthy economy as well, which presumably means high employment, reasonable profits, good productivity, and growth. In a moment, I want to bring in Sir Geoffrey Howe and Mr. Dennis Healy to see how far they have found that it works out like that in practice. But first, Professor Friedman, some commentators over here have suggested that our present government, the Conservative government, has based some of its economic policies on your theories. How far, in your observation, do you feel that they are indeed following the true gospel? And if they are, why is inflation still rising? Well, uh, first of all, I might give a, a credit to Dennis Healy. He was the first one who followed the gospel. To the best of my knowledge, he was the first one in Britain who introduced monetary targets. Isn't that right, Dennis sure. Healy? So that I am delighted to have two monitors here with me as well as myself. <laughs> the British government has pronounced excellent targets. But as of this date, they have, like the American government, not carried them through. Money supply is still rising at a very rapid rate. It has not really been brought under control. There's a great difficulty in the political sphere that everybody wants things to happen instantly. We want instant cures. We want instant coffee. We want instant tea. We want instant cures for inflation. There are no instant cures. Britain, like the United States, has gotten into its present difficulty over a very long period, and you are not going to get out of it overnight. You, like we, and like the Japanese in 1973, have to have the courage and the will to follow a policy over a five-year period. If the br present British government uh, follows the policy it has pronounced, which I hope and trust it will, it will be able to check inflation, to bring it down to a reasonable level. What's required? as a first step is to get control of the money supply. But I want to emphasize that while that's a sufficient condition to bring down inflation, it's not a sufficient condition to produce a healthy economy. It's a necessary condition for a healthy economy. But in addition, to produce a healthy economy, you have to cut government spending. You have to cut the rate of taxes on people. You have to give, keep people, give people more incentive. You have to free up the economy, make investment more attractive to the economy. You have to reduce the role of the government in the industrial commercial sector. Those seem to me to be the essential requirements in a broad way for not only stemming inflation, but also restoring a so healthy economy. Are you modifying there to some extent what you said at the end of the film? Because your very final comment was that every country that has had the courage to persist in a policy of slow monetary growth 
has been able to cure inflation and at the same time achieve a healthy economy. Now, I think that's a correct factual statement because those countries that have had the courage to persist in slow monetary growth have also been countries that have adopted many of these other policies that are necessary for a healthy economy. I think that statement by itself is a little misleading and I wish I had expanded it a little to say that it has been able to achieve a healthy economy by also doing certain other things. If, uh, if the limits of time hadn't been there, I would have well, tried let, to expand Let me turn now to Sir Geoffrey. Sir Geoffrey, are you a Friedmanite? And if you are a Friedmanite, why have you not fully achieved control of the money supply, as the professor says? Because if I were a Friedmanite, and I don't think I'm an anythingite, I'm, I'm a man of common sense and reasonable determination, taking advice, a great deal of it, from Professor Friedman. But if I was a Friedmanite, I would certainly not ask that question in that form. Because from what Professor Friedman has already said, uh, to expect me to be elected on May the 3rd, to introduce a budget on June the 16th, and to have solved even the single problem of inflation within 10 months, is to misunderstand Friedman completely. Well, Dennis Healy, um, were you a monetarist in disguise? You were sometimes called in, uh, by one commentator, a sheep in wolf's clothing on this matter. You always <laughs> said that you uh, were not a monetarist and you strongly attacked monetary doctrines in your speeches, but on the other hand, a lot of monetarists rather approved of what you were doing. Which is the real Dennis Healy? I'm not a monetarist at all. I believe, as I think most sensible people would, that you can't control inflation if you let the money supply grow three times as fast as national income in money terms, which is what Mr. Barber did his last two years. And in fact, I did what Professor Friedman recommends. I kept the growth of money supply to 10% for five years, not just for three. I noticed Sir Geoffrey published in a letter to Mr. Ducan the other day the figures for my last three years. Uh, the money supply which Sir Geoffrey inherited was 10.7% in 19. Uh, 78.9 is against 30%, which was my inheritance from Mr. Barber. But I've never thought that controlling the money supply is enough. I disagree totally with Professor Friedman that wages cannot be a source of inflation if you control the money supply. I think the experience all over the world is to that effect. I also believe that governments have the right and duty to manage demand so that the economy ro runs as close to capacity as possible. And as you know, I have stimulated the economy when I thought it was necessary, as I did in 78. Uh, and we also succeeded in persuading the Germans to stimulate their economy at the Bonn summit. I think my disagreement with Professor Friedman and with his disciples in the present government, of whom I gather Sir Geoffrey is a sort of country member of Professor Friedman's club is that while I think it's essential to give a man a dose of quinine if he's suffering from fever, I don't think you can sit him down at a table and say now you drink a pint of quinine for breakfast, a qu pint for lunch and a pint for dinner and you're not to eat or drink anything else for three years which is the policy of the present government. I think that is a recipe for what the government has predicted. Three years of unparalleled austerity, but I'd also say it's quite unnecessary austerity. I think countries like Austria and Germany, which have pursued sensible wage policies and sensible policies of demand management, have run substantial deficits in the process, uh, have a record of which we should be proud if we could achieve it, and I think that under a government of a similar nature, we will. I think Sir Geoffrey should I have a chance might, to respond to the obvious I, political I, point. I might respond, because I hadn't thought we were here for one of the usual political knockabouts. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not here, nor I think of the audience here, to discuss my inheritance from this or that or the other. Very well. I, 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 Dennis, you are incorrigible. I, quite, I am. And quite, quite, and quite incapable of sustaining a reasonable, balanced, objective discussion with someone who doesn't have much time to be in this country or in the studio. Now, I had thought that he paid a legitimate tribute to you for your insight into the importance of monetary policy as a crucial but not in itself sufficient factor for the management of the economy. Uh, I'm not going to begin making points about the fact that you had, a, I think, a monetary growth rate of about 16% in 77 8 because if you look at it in the long run, one knows that it's very difficult to achieve a, 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 a given figure in a year. But the point I, I would like to make is surely we all agree that monetary control is fundamental. Uh, we all agree that it is not sufficient by itself. We all agree that if you have got other economic ailments, then you need other economic policies as well. We all agree that it takes a long time to carry it through. And I just thought we also agree, and I'd like to ask Professor Friedman about this,
But one of the crucial things that you have to get happening alongside the pursuit of monetary discipline uh, is a response from the labor market. Uh, your pattern of pay bargaining has got to respond to the monetary constraint. Otherwise, if people continue to bargain for very high pay settlements throughout the economy as a whole, they're likely at least to be raising unemployment very substantially. That's one of the pains of, of, of the long period of transition. And I think that the higher the level from which you start in terms of inflation, the more difficult that it, it is. The extent to which you can respond to it depends very much on the institutions of the society in which you're operating. And I noticed you took Japan as an interesting example. But threw in the rather uh, telling sentence, uh, there's nothing special about Japan. I suspect there is, that there is a greater willingness to accept real wage reductions as part of the process of adjustment, a greater, a, a different pattern of adjustment to changing unemployment rates. And one of the difficulties that faced Dennis Healy, as well as myself in this country, is to overcome the much greater institutional resistance to recapturing realistic levels of pay bargaining if we're, if we're to carry this monetary cure through? I don't really think there is anything special about Japan. In point of fact, uh, Japan did go through a very difficult period. If we come to your problem here, it's a very difficult problem. But I believe that two different things have been confused. One thing is the extent of unionization and the role of trade unions. The other thing is the extent of nationalization and government ownership and operation of enterprise. I believe the real problems that you have are much more due to the nationalization and government ownership than they are to the unionization. That unionization alone, if unions are bargaining with the people who really pay them, pretty directly with their customers through the private employers, it's one thing. If unions are bargaining with civil servants who are spending somebody else's money, it's quite a different thing. And the areas in which you have had in Britain the greatest difficulties in wage bargaining have been those areas in which the government is the ultimate employer. But I want to get back to what Dennis Healy said. He said it was a right and duty of the government to manage demand. It does no good to have a right and duty if you don't have the ability. And the plain fact is that as James Callahan said in that film, no government in the world has demonstrated the ability to have a fine management of demand. You cited Germany. The German policy has primarily been a policy of monetary restraint Germany got into an inflation when she pegged her exchange rate to the American dollar and was forced to inflate, much against her own will. When she cut that and appreciated, she was able to restore monetary discipline. The Germans have engaged in an effective policy of monetary control. In the United States, the American government has tried demand management. The result in America, the result in Britain, the result in Sweden, the result in every country you look at was that over the period of demand management, you had both, ri ri both rising inflation and rising unemployment. The plain fact is you do not have the ability to engage in the kind of fine-tuning that your government has attempted. And, and when you try to do it, you go off the track. Your good intentions about holding down monetary growth go by the board. And instead, you launch into a roller coaster of the kind we in America have had these past 20 years. Can I, can, really I call a, can I make just a procedural yes. suggestion that we should talk first, because it comes first, about the question, can governments control the money supply yes. at all? That's yes. Secondly, about whether if they do control it, that is a sufficient condition, as uh, yes. the professor says, and not just a necessary condition, as you've both said, of controlling inflation. And thirdly, whether if you do control inflation that way, you will get very high unemployment That's and other problems. Right. Now, on the first question of can governments control the money supply? Yes. You tried for four years, but you're skeptical about it, don't you? No, yes, I am. Uh, what I would say about money monetary control is what I'd say about demand management, that it's possible, but it's very difficult and uncertain, uh, and the tools you have are not adequate for the job. If you take money supply to begin with, and do let me answer to Professor Friedman, even if I have to quote our experience, because I think comic strip Sachi and Sachi demonstration of economics, not very relevant unless you can relate its conclusions with the actual experience of real governments. Now, in the 24 OECD countries, there are 23 definitions of money, all different. If you take the governments that have had monetary targets, and they've only had targets for the last five or six years, the one country which has never met one is Japan, oddly enough. The country which has done best is Canada, has met them every time, yet has the worst inflation record. We do better than the average, better than France or Germany. We've met them two times out of three we missed, as Sir Jeffrey said quite rightly. Uh, 
in 1977-8. And the difficulty is, as I know Professor Friedman knows in his academic <laughs> moments, that as Mr. Hayek said, there is no definition of money which is adequate to describe it. And secondly, as Mr. Goodhart of the Bank of England said, the moment you use a statistical regularity for control purposes, it changes its behavior. Money supply is very, control is very difficult indeed in all countries in the world. And the interesting thing is that countries' performance on inflation does not correlate very closely with their success in controlling money. Now, the second point, because you asked me that, is about demand management. That is very difficult too. Although what Mr. Callaghan said in the extract you just quoted only proves that you shouldn't let your son-in-law write your speeches. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> the I point, think what else you mean by that? The, the former point, Prime Minister, in my experience, was yes, his own speeches. No, I, I, I think he uh, was mistaken when he said that. It didn't reflect his behaviour, either when he was lecturing with me, the Germans, to inject another 1% of GDP in demand in Bonn, which produced their extraordinary growth performance last year. But it is difficult because we can't predict, for example, how much people will save. The savings ratio is under half what it normally is in the United States. It's more than double what it is in Britain. And you can't predict how much of the money you give away will be spent on imports rather than exports. The point I'm trying to get over, and if I succeed in this and nothing else, I think my presence here will be justified, is that there is no single miracle cure to the problems of any economy. You have to use demand management. You have to use money to control. In a country with a large unionized sector, you have to have some sort of pay policy. Some we'll countries have succeeded. Germany, Germany, Germany. We'll Germany. let me, find, I, 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 let let me let finish take, with this. take the first question first, because Sir Jeffrey is really but entitled to have a word. Let me finish with this word. point on Germany. Quickly. Germany, in fact, has run a larger public sector deficit than we have for most of the last few years. Austria, which has a better inflation record, has run a strict monetary policy, tying the Austrian shilling to the Deutsche Mark, has run even bigger deficits and has financed them by borrowing abroad. But because they have run a balanced mix of policies appropriate to their national circumstances, they've achieved lower inflation, higher growth, and a healthier balance of payments than any other country in Europe. Well, you've talked about all three questions, but, but no, let me, let me ask the Chancellor. Let, let me okay. please ask the Chancellor. Is I'd, he I'd, confident you can control the money supply? I'd, like, I'd like to let Milton answer the just immense farrago of selective ex exhibitionism we've just heard from, 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 from country after country around the world. Well, what I, about I, answering them for a change? Because you didn't when I you were asked questions to, in your first programme at all. You I dodged will, them. I will be glad to answer them. Let, let the Chancellor if I may speak. If I may separate the competence and, okay. and try, try, try and offer the views of a, of a reasonable man of common sense on this. Now, clearly, it is difficult to measure and control the money supply. Uh, the examples that Dennis quotes, the, all the examples of history, even the examples that Milton quotes many countries, show that it is difficult. Um, but nobody challenges that it is necessary and important. Nobody suggests that the by itself it is sufficient. Now, he it seems does. To me, he does. No, he doesn't. No, no, he doesn't. To, no, no, to, to no, no, cure no, 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 no. To cure inflation, it's sufficient. But let me but, go but back. Can I, can, I, can I just? I mean, I, I'd like to be clear that we are on common ground about this. Right. That monetary policy is crucial, important fundamental to the conquest of inflation. Of course, it may be difficult to measure, difficult to manage. The more complex and the more sophisticated an economy, the more difficult it becomes. I noticed that the Confederates were able, apparently, to solve it in a fortnight, and it took the Japanese five years. <laughs> so clearly, it is a matter which becomes more complicated the more sophisticated you become. But is it right? It is sufficient, but difficult. Sufficient but difficult for inflation. But I want to go to the sm extraordinary smoke screen that Dennis Healy threw But you deny any let of the me, facts for a I moment, let, me, let me answer your facts. Yeah. I'll be glad to. Because if there's any subject on which I have spent more years of study, it is precisely the relationship between money and inflation. Yeah, but also and money and point. income, I will try to. Number one, the definition of money is a pure smoke screen. Every central bank which is trying to find an excuse for its failure proceeds to put out a smoke screen of eight different M targets, M definitions. The plain fact is that it doesn't matter which one you choose. If you choose any one and control it, and you look at its performance in relation to national income, you will find that it works. Now, the best of them all, in, in Britain, you make your job abnormally difficult by having a very inefficient system of monetary control. And again, the central banks of the world are past masters at the art 
of engaging in self-fulfilling prophecies, of passing regulations and rules that make it more difficult for them to control the money supply. Given the will, there is no country in the world today that does not have the possibility of effectively controlling the money supply. But in can Great you explain, Britain, Professor, in why Great Japan Britain, failed to meet its monetary targets me, on any occasion? Excuse me. If you look at that chart in there, you will see that for the five years from 1973 to 1978, the rate of growth of the money supply that we plotted there, M2, was between 10 and 15 percent, 10 and 13 percent most of the year. Now, Japan is a rapidly growing country. I estimated about a dozen years ago that for Japan to have stable prices required a rate of monetary growth for Japan of 13 percent a year. They kept the money supply for five years within that level, far from failing to meet their, uh, their monetary targets. If I look at their monetary performance, which is what matters, they kept the money supply within a very narrow range over a five-year period, and during that five-year period they brought inflation. If I look at Germany, Germany has, on six months' basis, failed to meet its target. If you look on it on a year-by-year -year basis, if you look on it in year after year, it has done so. If you take the smokescreen question you brought in about borrowing, I have never argued that deficits are the cause of inflation, except as the deficits are financed by printing money. The source of inflation is too much money. Countries like Germany may well have large borrowing requirements, provided they finance it either from abroad That's or right. from real savings That's at home. Right. It does not contribute to inflation. The largest deficits before recent years in American history were in the Great Depression from 1930, in 1932 and 33, when prices were falling of course, drastically. Of in 1919 and 20, Goodness when me. prices in the United States were going up very rapidly, the United States government is running a surplus. The crucial question for inflation is the increase in the quantity of money. Now, borrowing is relevant. It's highly important for a different reason, because of its effect on investment. When the government borrows, those funds are not available to private industry. If it borrows from at home, you crowd out private investment, and this tends to reduce productivity. That's not the question of inflation. But I have never argued that for inflation, Borrowing was a requirement. Now, let's see, what, other was, this, what was the other smoke screen you put like up? Move, I'd like to move. With respect, I think you're making a point which I hope the suggestion is listening to, because the fact is that cutting the PSBR is not necessary for controlling the money supply, providing you finance it from outside the banking system, which is what Sir Jeffrey has done. But the real problem in our country is that you have vastly excessive bank lending to private companies. Now, I'd like to put this to you, Professor, and this is a genuine question for information and I'm not... I gather the others were not. No, the, the, others, <laughs> the others were not questions. They were statements of fact, which you haven't denied were facts, but you've said that they weren't important facts. Well, <laughs> listeners can judge that. But this is a, a genuine question. My own view, which is held by many monetary thinkers, who don't necessarily owe allegiance to you, they may owe it to dozens of other uh, gurus in the field, is that if you try to cut the supply of money excessively below the rate of growth of money GDP, you make the task impossible. I would say the reason why Sir Geoffrey has failed to achieve his targets, even with a 17% MLR, is that he's trying to cut the supply of money to a third the increase in inflation generated in part by tax increases, which I see you criticised in an interview you you gave on Sunday. Now, my own feeling about monetary targets is that if you try to fit, make them too strict, you will find the result is much less in a fall in prices than a fall in output. As you know, it's been demonstrated in the United States by the same techniques as you used, econometric techniques with regression analysis, that uh, the experiment of very strict monetary control by Mr. Simon in the United States uh, led Mr. To Simon never was in charge of monetary control. Excuse me, he was the Secretary of Treasury. Well, I'm sorry, I was assuming American uh, finance ministers have the same influence as <laughs> no, British no, ones. No, not no, at all. If you like, Arthur Burns, who incidentally has never been a monetarist, no, but he, he, hasn't. he did try it at that time. It led to a 90 cent loss of output for every 10 cent fall in prices. Now, that's a trade off which a democratic country won't accept. And of course, it didn't accept it. It elected Mr. Carter. Let, let, let Professor Friedman answer. Sure, I'll be glad to. In the first place, I really would like to make it clear that the doctrines I proclaim are not original with me by any means. In fact, if I have to find a source of them, they are David Hume. David Hume's essay on money can be read today 
with pleasure and profit, and it's absolutely applicable to today's conditions. I can think of no brief statement that it would have done more good for you to have absorbed before you were Chancellor of the Exchequer, or that I can recommend to suggest Let me say, that. Hume is my main inspirer as a politician as well as an economist, <laughs> because he said, unless you can demonstrate but not let with me go argument, back. but in fact, Confine it, to the, consign it to the flames, it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion, and you keep that in your head, Professor Friedman. Perhaps, perhaps yeah. we should explain that David Hume was an 18th century British or Scottish. Oh, yes. Economist. He preceded Adam but Smith. Now, he was in the middle of the 18th century. Professor, would but you let respond me go quickly to Mr. Hedges? Sure. I want to move on to the next point. Sure. The, uh, the answer is that the appropriate target in, in cutting money supply, you should do it gradually over a five year right. period. I am not in favor of uh, when you have a moderate inflation, even an inflation as large as that in Britain, I am not in favor of the kind of shock tactics That's that right. were necessary in Germany exactly. in 1948. Exactly. You should do it gradually over a five-year period, but you should not link it, as you did, to the GDP, to the nominal national income. That's a self-defeating process. That's a nominal target. What you should do is to announce in advance that over the next five years, the monetary growth, you should have a long period announcement, you should do this in advance so people can count on it and not shift from year to year, not have fine tuning. And you should announce in advance that you are going to have the money supply, it is now growing, I note, for the past six months at the rate of 13% a year, your M3. That the next six months, the next year it will grow at 11%. The next year it will grow at 10, at nine, at 10 or 9%. The next year at 7 or 8 And over a five-year period, will be brought down to 3% per year, which is where it ought to be kept. And it ought not to be varied annually by the uh, nominal, notional, national income. Let's leave the question of whether you can control the money supply there and move on to the question whether, if you do control it, that by itself will be enough to curb inflation. Can you persuade, can you explain, Professor Friedman, because I don't think the film altogether did, what is the mechanism, what is the chain of cause and effect which leads from those printing presses that you showed stopping or slowing down to prices in the shops for the housewife yes. and the consumer also slowing down at a time when perhaps oil prices are rising, import prices are rising, raw material prices are rising and maybe wages are rising? Well, the answer to that is that people in general have a reasonably stable relation between the amount of money they want to hold and the amount they earn and spend. That if their incomes go up, they want to hold somewhat more money. If their incomes go down, they want to hold somewhat less. If they find that the amount of money they are holding that they have in their pockets or on deposit has gone down relative to their income, they will try to build it up again. How will they build it up again? By slowing spending. The, there are a number of steps between a change in the rate of money growth and prices. The first step is that people's money balances go down and nothing happens. The second step is that they try to restore their money balances and in the process they reduce their spending. And then, as Mr. Healy quite properly said, the first link goes to output and employment. There's about a six months lag in general for Britain and the United States for countries like that. The Confederate it was much shorter as it is in countries that have very violent inflation. Uh, there's about a six months delay. So it passes through the real economy. There's no magic the real bypass economy. relationship between the printing press and prices no. not, not hurting anybody. No, it goes through the real economy. It does hurt somebody. Absolutely. Unfortunately, there's no alternative. Because if you increase the money supply and speed up inflation, you also hurt somebody. Because as people learn about that, they speed up the process of raising wages. As you've observed, as Mr. Callahan said, the process of injecting uh, purchasing power produces higher inflation. When an economy has been sick, as Mr. Healy said, there is no miracle cure, I agree. And what you've got, the only choice a country like the United States or Britain has now is whether it accepts a temporary period of difficulty as a temporary period on the way to curing inflation or as another stage in going into still higher inflation and still higher unemployment. So to go back to answer your question, stage number one, lower cash balances. Stage number two, lower spending. Stage number three, lower output employment. Stage number four, a reduction in the rate of change of prices. Now, in the history of Britain and the United States, the time span on the average has been six months between a slowing of money growth, slowing of the economy. It's been almost two years, roughly two years on the average, sometimes less, sometimes more. These are not perfectly precise relationships. There's a good deal of leeway in them, of course but it's been roughly two years. As I may say, William Stanley Jevons pointed out in the 1860s, 
between a slowing of money growth and a slowing of inflation. That's the mechanism through which monetary slowness tends to affect prices. But the mechanism, if provided you buy the delay and provided you accept the unemployment, is sufficient by itself. That's all it's you need. Now, it doesn't mean that the, the end result, how good the end result will be, will depend on what other things you are doing in the meantime. Well, we'll come to that <coughs> later. Chancellor, you said that you thought it was necessary, but not sufficient, am I right? And what else is it necessary, in your opinion, in order to curb inflation? Well, I think we're moving on to the same kind of ground, are, are we not? Um, it is clear, and I, I gather that through the fog, Dennis Healy accepts it, that monetary control... Very clear sky on the mountain peak where I stand, Jeffrey. Well, there always is from your sure, point of view, Dennis, not, right. for, not for anybody else. Thank is. But that's I, I, where I, prophets always stand, isn't it? I know. Yes. But the, the, the point I, I do want to try and establish, because it, it, it is always beset by denunciatory phrases about gurus and so on from Dennis Healy, he can never actually candidly confess that monetary policy is crucial and central, it's crucial. And, 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 and it is not to be dismissed or, or, or camouflaged. I don't dismiss uh, it. No, but, but one, of, one of the techniques... I published Target has yes, the first chance in Britain but, to but, do but, so. But, but, Dennis, one of the techniques which you regularly adopt, having... What about on, getting having, your point let out, me, eh? let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me try and say something without you interrupting it. Yeah. Having asserted, quite rightly, the importance oh. of monetary targets, having <laughs> gone along with Peter Dre and Jim Callaghan in making the Blackpool speech about it. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, having helped to forge this weapon in, in our political and economic armory, you can scarcely resist an opportunity when it presents itself for denouncing and denigrating and defaming it. Now, that doesn't actually help the pursuit of monetary policy. We agree that it is important, crucial, but not by itself sufficient. Now, the other things that you need... No, to... he is, is sufficient. No, if we no, just no, stick no, to the high academic level, which, which yeah. we aspire, he does say it is sufficient. You, well, I, you no, question want, it. Why? I, well, I want, I want to move on to the other part, part of that. Milton certainly says that it isn't sufficient to restore economic health. We're on common ground on that. There are various other things that can be wrong and that are wrong with our economy and with other economies. And there are various other things which make it more difficult for monetary disciplines to apply themselves effectively and quickly. There's, a, mm -hmm. there's an agreed That's delay. Uh, it, I didn't want people to be misled about this. The six months linkage, the two year linkage, uh, there's still a five year time pattern for the Japanese to get back to, to a, a tolerable rate of inflation. Now, the, the other things which do make it much more difficult are, for example, the, the stickiness of the labor market, the extent to which, to some extent, it is dominated by uh, a very high degree of trade unionism. We have in this country about 50 percent, in the United States about 20 percent. The extent to which that is coupled with public ownership and public management, because if you've got heavily unionized labor bargaining with uh, public ownership using other people's money, not, not exposed to the profitability test, and particularly if it's in a monopoly area, then you maximize the difficulties of, of getting, getting an effective response. Uh, and I noticed that um, the film showed us with the, the garbage men, I think, as, as, as um, they're known in the United States and, and the hospital attendants here. Even in the United States, um, the biggest troubles have arose, arisen over the post office and the air traffic controllers Absolutely. and the teachers in, in New York State. So, 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 so that beyond the pursuit of monetary targets difficult and the imposition of monetary discipline difficult, essential but not by self-sufficient, one has to be making such other changes in the structure of the market as one can. Privatization, diminishing the extent of state control and monopoly control, addressing oneself to the restrictive power that trade unions can have beyond what is necessary by any reasonable standard. Chancellor, in talking, me, about this, wanna, just, just no, moment, wanna, in talking about the stickiness of the labour market and those factors, are you hinting that it might be necessary and appropriate in some circumstances to have any form of incomes policy? It depends, does it not, what you mean by incomes policy. If you mean that the pattern and general level of pay bargaining has to be responsive to the movement of your monetary aggregates, that is what you have in, in, in Western Germany, uh, where you do not have an incomes policy, indeed where intervention by law in pay or prices is forbidden by the Constitution. But nevertheless, the institutions are such that they respond effectively to the uh, assertion of monetary discipline. Now, in our own experience in this country, in, under all governments, we found that the attempt to install and operate over any long period of time uh, an incomes policy of the institutional kind that we've all had our shots at actually becomes counterproductive, increases resistance and doesn't work. So what we are necessarily obliged to move towards is the growth of understanding and responsiveness to the monetary disciplines. Very difficult, but I think, again, not much difference between my objective in that respect and that on which Dennis Healy set out in the autumn of 1977, I think it was, and he, to which he was 
searching in, in, in the white paper he published no, last, but, last spring. But if I could say this, and it's uh, uh, difficult for me to say anything without being accused of being uh, unfair in what I say, but if oh, I refer... But, oh, Mr. Hilly, get on with if it. I refer to, to my own experience, I myself believe that we couldn't conceivably have got inflation down from 28%, which it had reached, in my view, largely because of excess monetary growth in 1972-3, and I see I Professor Friedman agrees with me that, uh, to well under 10% in the middle of 78, unless we'd had uh, pay policy as well as a monetary policy. I also think we would not have had the degree of support for pay policy which we got or the cooperation from the unions in a much wider field. We had no strikes in those years either to speak of unless we'd been prepared to run a fiscal policy which took some account of the social objectives of the people whom it affected. Now, if I could say this to Professor Friedman and to Sir Geoffrey, Professor Friedman thinks that monetary control alone is sufficient to control inflation. Sir Geoffrey disagrees, so he hasn't made it very clear what else is needed. I myself believe that it is not enough alone, and I'll tell you why. Because Professor Friedman's approach to this, as all other questions he's discussed in his broadcasts, assumes that <coughs> there is such a thing as a free market with perfect competition, Not such as existed in the rural society of colonial America, Not which was the never-never uh, land with, to which he treated Not us in his very first program. Now, the fact is, under a democracy, people use their democratic right to protect themselves against the operation of the market, whether they're employers or workers. The only way you can make his policy work is by giving the state the power to take these democratic rights of self-protection away. And this, I think, is the central problem. If you, I can point to examples all over the world where countries with large public sectors, a great deal of state intervention, uh, incidentally, Sweden is one, but so is Japan, of course. Public, uh, intervention is enormous there. If you look at the control of inflation, Mr. Schacht had a more remarkable success even than Dr. Earhart in breaking the inflation of the Weimar Republic, and he did it through large-scale intervention. Now, what I appeal to you all to do is do accept there is no single miracle cure. We don't understand the behavior of the economy. We don't understand why the savings ratio has halved in America, has doubled in Britain. And therefore, let's have a balanced mix of policies, see how we go all the time. You set yourself on automatic pilot today and say you're going to reduce the money supply every year for five years and touch nothing else let to us, run to disaster. Let us cut through this terrible rhetoric. What Mr. Healy is saying, if you really want an economy properly, give Mr. Healy control to run it. Now, that is not, I, not, I submit, a policy. It's not an economic analysis. I'm not saying that at all. The argument that, uh, that the kind of policies I'm proposing require a perfect competitive economy are nonsense. I'm talking about the kind of market you actually have in the world. I'm talking about those changes in the markets which are perfectly feasible. But I want to get off this well-trod ground onto some other areas in which, if, if, if the Chancellor will uh, forgive me, I want to press him and not merely Sir Dennis Healy. Uh, I believe that over and above, there are many, many uh, uh, rigidities in the labor market. But there are some other rigidities which are utterly unnecessary and which government itself is responsible for. If we want to ease the path to cutting inflation, one of the most effective things you could do to ease that path is to is to adjust all taxes for inflation. Eliminate the situation under which you have what we call in the film taxation without representation. Another most effective thing you can do is to borrow on the basis of purchasing power securities. I think if the government is serious, if you really intend to bring down inflation, there is no justification for issuing long-term securities at rates of interest that assume that inflation will continue at 10 or 12 or 13 percent a year. You should not be issuing five, 10-year, 15-year bonds at rates of interest of, what are they now, 13, 14, 15 percent? Instead, you should demonstrate the confidence which you have in the policies that you are following by issuing securities which are protected against inflation. Say to the people, we have enough confidence <laughs> in our policies. So if you lend us 100 pounds today, we promise 10 years from now to pay you back an amount of a number of pounds which will buy as much in goods and services as that 100 pounds today will buy. Now, those are two steps.
of eliminating rigidities in the system, which I believe would have an enormously favorable effect in promoting the flexibility and the adjustment to inflation, uh, to the bringing down of inflation, to the cutting of inflation. If, um, if today you have people who borrow at very, very high interest rates, their interest is not to get inflation down. Their interest is to have inflation continue so that they can pay back that borrowing in cheaper pounds. That's true of the government, of course. That's true of the government as well. Now, why is it not a desirable government policy for the government to, uh, to adjust both taxes and borrowing for inflation? I think it's a very interesting question, and, and if one begins applying indexation, as I know Mil Milton would have one do on a pretty wide scale, I'm not sure that at the end of the day it actually makes the problem easier. If you take it to apply not just to tax thresholds and, and, and um, indexing of government borrowing, but also to social benefits, but also to pay in the public sector, but also to pay generally, I, I think that you do run the danger of uh, enthroning expectations of, of protection by political fiat against things that would otherwise be attributable to changes in the market. We noticed, you see, the, um, the garbage men, when Milton was talking about them on the film and, and the hospital attendants, uh, I wrote it down at the time, he said they felt justifiably aggrieved I wrote it down because their pay had not been allowed to keep up with the cost of living. They were justifiably uh, No, but one, once you have someone of Milton's authority saying that you have a justifiable grievance, if your pay, come what may for the demand oh, for your no, services, no. If, if you begin saying you have a justifiable no, grievance, no, no. Now, uh, let me just make your, yeah. I'd, I'd like your comments on sure. If you begin saying it's a justifiable grievance, that your pay has not been allowed to keep up with the cost of living, then you really are giving to government the authority to entrench expectations across a very wide field. And I think that's I one, one of the anxieties that seems to me to have been borne out in those societies where indexation has become universal. Not at all. I think there's a very, very different issue involved. And that is between doing things openly and directly and doing things indirectly. If the real wages of garbage collectors is too high, then you ought to negotiate a lower real wage. The point is that government ought not by indirection, by stealth, if you, not deliberate stealth, not admitted stealth, <laughs> but inflation is a form of stealth. Inflation is a form of readjusting contracts. Of course, of course. You ought not to do by inflation what you're not willing to do openly. If the government wants to increase taxes, let it vote, require the government to vote the higher taxes. Let it not be in the position where without doing anything by inflating, taxes automatically well, rise. Could I say to Jeffrey here, I mean to be fair to him, he did vote in opposition for an amendment to the finance bill which is now part of our law ah. under which governments have to raise tax allowances every year in line with inflation and we're all waiting to see whether in fact he implements it this year or not. Well now, now again, let me say, let me say again, the argument is not that you should necessarily implement it. No. The okay. argument is that you should be required to do openly and in the political limelight whatever it is that you believe it's desirable to do. And that goes and back to, to your garbage but, but, workers. But can, can I bring it back to the point on which I think we all agree? Um, the purpose which we had in mind in voting for the amendments, which operate, as Dennis Healy says, was to achieve, as we called it, truth in taxation. Absolutely. Um, and, and Parliament has got the right to override those indexation provisions. And actually, one of the more harmonious aspects about our strange life together, Dennis, is that the budget that we introduced Absolutely. jointly last April, the standstill budget between the yeah. defeat of the government and the, and the election, did almost nothing save index the tax allowances for that yeah. year. Over but Nigel Lawson's dead body, if you recall. Gentlemen, we must stick begin. to the high academic level that we've so far achieved. <laughs> let me move Professor Friedman onto the third area, namely the healthy economy. Now, the British government, ever since a uh, coalition white paper of 1944 called the Employment Policy White Paper, the American government, ever since the Employment Policy Act of uh, 19, the Employment Act of 1946, have been at least notionally committed to a thing called full employment. People have believed that you can achieve that by something to do with managing the budget deficit, government spending and taxes and so forth. Now you have challenged that view most strongly. You say there's a natural rate of unemployment, it is set by factors other than what monetary policy or budget policy, that the economy will keep coming back to that whatever governments do and therefore it is a waste of time to try to achieve full employment by the methods which have been traditionally used and all that will happen will be you will get more and more inflation. Now this is the question here. Suppose you can control inflation in the way that you describe. What level of unemployment will you get? Because that, we have forecasts of two million people unemployed. That depends on what other policies you follow. 
if the government follows a policy as it has said it will. I may say I am fully in accord with the objectives which the government has set. I may say also I honor them fully, especially for eliminating exchange control. I think eliminating exchange control was a great step toward human freedom entirely aside from its economic aspects. Please come to the natural rate of unemployment. <laughs> All right, now I will come to the natural rate of unemployment. If the government follows a policy of encouraging investment by having a low borrowing requirement itself, by cutting government spending, if it uh, denationalizes, if it gets industry out of the hands of government and into private hands and gives people an incentive, if it allows uh, free market competitive forces to work, if it adopts policies with respect to unemployment compensation, with respect to social benefits and so on, which do not make it more profitable to be unemployed than to be employed. Those are a range of policies which are within the realm of government. If what government happen, adopts those policies, you will in the course of three or four or five years come back to a level of unemployment which is a kind of level that you experience on the average in the early post-war decade. It may make a lot of difference to a government whether it's three or five years. It makes a lot of difference to a government whether it's three or five years. We as economists <laughs> have done a great deal of harm by professing to know more than we do. Yeah, yeah. The attempt by economists to say we can predict finally whether income's going to go up by 1.3 percent next year or one point, we've overpromised. Mm. We do not know enough to know that. I cannot tell you. But you know enough be to done. tell Sir Jeffrey that within three to five years it will come back to a high level of employment. Yes. Whatever trade unions do. However, well, they, what it, vigorously they bargain excuse collectively. Excuse me, what trade unions do is not going to be independent of these other policies. Well, whatever if they the try to do. Whatever if trade they unions, to do. first of all, it's a mistake to talk about trade unions. There are trade union leaders and there are trade union members. And their interests do not always coincide, as you've just been seeing in Britain right now. If you follow the kind of policies I've described, and if the people can have confidence, that's the most important thing, that the people have confidence that the government intends to follow this policy and is determined to stick with it. They will adjust their expectations. What people bargain for, people are not fools. They don't bargain for pieces of paper. They bargain for purchasing power. And if they have a confident expectation that the inflation rate is going to come down, what they'll bargain for will be different than if they think the inflation rate's going to go up. So I think if you follow these broad lines of policy, of fostering the operation of a market, giving people incentives, Getting the government out of this business and, and not doing, as our government in the United States has done, silly things like supporting Chrysler, which should go into stronger hands. It's an absurd thing to do. If you follow sensible policies, then I think the experience of other countries suggests that three to five years is about the period of time that on the average in you know, most other countries that have followed such policies have been requisite to get to a reasonable level of unemployment. Mr. Healy. Well, I don't agree with uh, Professor Friedman on that. Again, you can point to some countries where you've had high employment with the sort of free market economy he suggested, others where you've had it with a social market economy, which is very different. The German government, for example, disagrees totally with Professor Friedman on how to handle welfare. They think it should be done through the government. They spend much more than we do, much more incidentally than they spend on defence. Uh, and there are countries which uh, have taken our position, which have had long periods like Sweden, where they've had very high employment uh, and low inflation. Uh, again, I come back to my central point that you have to look at the situation in the country concerned. Now, in our country, I don't think you'll make a success of any policy unless you have the support of the unions. And when I say unions, I mean the leaders and their members. Interesting thing here, Milton, is that in recent weeks in some unions, you've had the rank and file voting for strikes against the advice of their leaders. In others, you've seen them voting not to have strikes against the advice of their leaders. And one problem about the situation is that, in my view, and I'm trying not to make a purely party point, but it is a party matter, of course, it's heavily argued here, I think that the present government is enormously weakening the power of moderate leaders to control their own workforce. But I think in this country, as in Switzerland, uh, as in, not Switzerland, as in Austria, Scandinavia and Germany, a balance between monetary policy, demand management and pay policy, voluntary by the appallingly difficult, it's as difficult as demand management, difficult as monetary control, to get some consensus on pay. You won't do it without consensus. But without a consensus on pay, 
I think the experience which we've suffered this year in which the absence of pay controls and strict monetary policy has produced a very much higher increase in earnings than we've had any time since 1975 will be repeated. Mr. Healy, would you clarify this? Do you believe it's impossible to run a successful economic policy in terms of unemployment and inflation without a permanent pay policy in the sense which you've described? I think, I think it's impossible without a permanent pay policy, but as I said, I don't think I'd agree with Sir Geoffrey that successive governments, which on and off since 1947 have tried to run one, nobody has yet found the perfect way of running one. I think the last government run one more successfully for longer than any other, and I think the interesting thing is that despite the breakdown last winter, there's more support in the British trade union movement for pay policy now than there has been any time since the war, and I'm afraid this is a matter we'll have to go back to argue out yet again. Chancellor, Chancellor policy has been tried over the millennia, and not merely the decades. Well, I, didn't I think it's a recipe for disaster. Every economic it is policy used. has been tried and right. failed in many countries. But pay policy has worked in Scandinavia for 40 years. Excuse it's worked me. in Germany. Concertiers action. I want the years out of date <laughs> in Scandinavia. Pay policy has been breaking down that's in payment. Scandinavia. <laughs> Sweden has been having all of the problems of Britain. Yeah, but that's because they don't Look, have I a wonder, government I wonder, which works for the union. Wonder, gentlemen, the <laughs> Chancellor, if the Chairman would allow me to say a word. Right. Um, Milton, you asked Dennis one question and he answered rather a different one. Let me just address myself to that first. Um, whether or not union leaders are representative of the rank and file of their membership, um, it, it's a very difficult question. My judgment would be that the union leadership, uh, and particularly that middle tier of militant union leadership, have been increasingly unrepresentative of, of, of the real insight of their rank and file membership in recent years. Uh, whether one can learn lessons from Aus Austria, Scandinavia and Germany, again I hesitate to do, but I do notice that the pattern of legislation which applies in the labour market in, those, or in all those countries is far more effectively designed to regulate and limit union irresponsibility than it is in this country. As far as pay policy is concerned, look, we all agree that we need to have a conformity between the general pattern of pay bargaining and, and the monetary growth rates. Uh, but we, we agree, surely, that that is achievable in Germany without institutionalized income policies at all, but that is the best way of doing it. And if one's to look at the experience of pay policy in this country, then the collapse last winter of the consensus on which Dennis Heder was priding himself really is the most manifest demonstration of how not to run a pay policy. Last point on, on employment and unemployment. Of course, the more you remove restrictions and interferences with the market mechanism, the higher your natural level of employment is going to be. But one other factor, the more prosperous a society becomes, then up to a point it can actually opt for a higher natural level well, of unemployment. Of it can say we're not going to turn the discarded mining towns of South Wales into ghost towns like those ones you were showing us in your film. We intend to preserve those communities to a greater or lesser extent. That may raise your natural level of, of unemployment. If you do it too far, you turn yourself into a state of museum towns. And the, the trick is to get sufficient labour mobility into new industries and new communities to have economic growth going along uh, and, and not freeze yourself in, into the past. And that's what we're trying Sir to do. Jeffrey, Professor Friedman, Mr Healy, I thank you all very much indeed. That is a fierce debate about one of the most fundamental questions that's faced mankind, at least of an economic kind, how do you control and cure inflation. It will go on and on and on, not least uh, next week in the debate that will begin after Sir Geoffrey's budget. This is the end of our series. We thank you for being with us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.